of course, in the 70s and 80s, there was black and white. Then in the 80s, color started to come, color film. And we shot on slides. Uh, and for some years, we shot both color and black and white together before going into fully color. And in those days, whether it was black and white or color, we had to ship films out, which meant that they went on flights. So you had to be running to airports, or you had custom agents that carried your film and shipped it out. At the other end, in New York or Paris, it was cleared, processed, edited. So you had to send captions with it. So it was a completely different delivery system. The digital world started in the late 90s when the slow, first slow digital cameras emerged um, and the file sizes were quite small. Uh, and then, the, because the internet had started, you could sort of transmit the stuff. Um, I don't see that there was any issue moving between any of these worlds. The whole thing is that it's just a different way of working. It just becomes faster. And unfortunately, the digital world still hasn't been able to replicate what silver captures. So however much it's gotten better, it's still, there is still a difference. So um, I'm waiting. I mean, I just bought this very expensive camera. I tried, wanted to take a picture. I charged my battery. I could have sworn I charged my battery. I put it back in. I, I pulled it out, and I turned it on, and it says, uh, you know, the battery's, either the battery's dead, uh, so this is it, you know. I mean, with a mechanical camera, that wouldn't happen. So, um, you know, the digital world challenges you sometimes even more. Don't think it's simple. Um, as a photojournalist, when you, uh, when you're forced to go into places uh, and document tragedies, so like the Bhopal gas tragedy or the riots uh, which happened. So uh, how do you stay sensitive to people who are grieving or who are, uh, so when you're photographing them, how do you make them feel like they just aren't subject to news? How can you be sensitive as a photographer in a period like that? I think that's a very individualistic choice to start with. Um, it's not always easy. For one, it's not easy to be photographing all this. You've got to keep your operational head together, yet you've got to be sensitive. So it's a question, it's a very fine balance. If you look at the TV these days and the wonderful sensitivity that they have by shoving cameras, lights, mics, into all sorts of people's faces just to get the story. I think that is horrible. But there is, having said that, there is, I think, scope for being able to be, uh, not cross that line. Often, these things happen more brutally when it's in a pack, because there, you, the whole competitive craziness of everything just sort of gets unplugged. And people just get in there, you know, like crazy, stupid media that, you know, just is insensitive. Um, I have, I must confess, been in that situation. So, you know, you try. It's not always that you can kind of hold yourself back. Hi, sir. I just wanted to ask you, based on your experience as a photographer, do you, do you think uh, for a student that wants to get in this field, uh, should he or she spend uh, three or four years at school or spend three or four years you know, working as an apprentice under a photographer and building your portfolio? Because you went, went through that yourself with your father, you know, looking at your father growing up and, and building your portfolio right out of high school. So what are your thoughts on that? Sir? Well, Again, there is no sure shot route. I think today you need a qualification because 
the time has become such where everybody looks at, oh, you come out of this school or that degree or this diploma. So that sort of seems to be the norm. In my time, you just became something and then you just became something more and you kind of uh, gravitated from there. Um, becoming an apprentice is not a bad idea, uh, but it depends what you're going to do as the apprentice. Because let's say I get many people say, can I be your assistant? The problem is I shoot on my own, I travel on my own, so there is really no scope to be an apprentice. But often it's not just necessarily about you know, doing the photography with that person. Because when you, somebody is photographing, you really don't know what they're seeing through their camera and how they are working and thinking and moving what they are up to. It's only when you see the result that it makes uh, sense. So for example, many people go and work in a photo agency. Like I know there are interns that go and work in the, the great photo agency Magnum where they are working with photographers' material and they're looking how they've gone through uh, shooting something, the sequence of something and arriving at that key image that they did. That, those sort of things sometimes also help you open up your head and mind to learn by handling uh, other photographers' work, seeing what, how they've done, what they've done, uh, what was before and what was after that key shot or how a story uh, has been put together. Um, so there is no really one route. I mean, the route that you are saying becoming an apprentice here in Bombay would be mainly to the studio fashion photographers. Well, that's a great way of learning, except that then you get trapped yourself. If you can escape it, it's great of not emulating the same style or getting too influenced where then you become Mark II of that photographer. So as long as you can keep your thinking pretty much intact, it's great to be able to go and be hands-on because, you know, you're using equipment, lighting, watching somebody, seeing the results, uh, seeing how that person is negotiating working with the talent that he or she is photographing, so uh, there's nothing wrong across India. There are at least a dozen photography schools that I know that have sprung up in the last five, seven years that are teaching photography, whether commercially, documentary, fashion, but the market is already saturated, so what is it that you're going to be able to do to stand out from the crowd is something that you need to start figuring out now. On an aesthetic level, on a business level, because being a freelancer is no different from having a shop. You can be the panwala. Um, in any little lane or you can strategically place yourself where there's a lot of traffic so it's really your choice how you open your shop how you get your clients how you keep your clients and those are things that you need to start to think about now not after you have left thank you very much let's have another round of applause for Mr. Papa.